The story's told at a circus. There was a huge elephant, a huge elephant that was tied to an 18-inch stake. And perhaps if you've been in those settings, you ever seen an elephant that is tied to just a little stake that I'm talking about? I mean, surely and absolutely, they could pull them, that stake out of the ground and they would be on their way. Why is it and how is it that that huge animal is kept in tow by an 18-inch stake? Well, as they say, that he tried it when he was a baby and it was unsuccessful. And so that elephant concluded he could never pull it out himself out of the ground, pull that stake out of the ground. So as this story goes, that big elephant stood, a massive creature that's able to pull trees out of the ground, and he is held captive by a puny stake. I've come to ask you, what small stake could your faith release you from? All of us experience those attempts to pull the distracting and the detaining and the debilitating stakes out of our soil, out of our ground. But those inner voices speak to us and make it so that we cannot be free. Oh, I've been doing this for a while, and here's what many people embrace. The way I am right now is the way I have to be for the rest of my life. They've declared it. Their faces have shown it. Maybe even today you've walked in and said, I've just accepted that there is an 18-inch stake that's going to keep me tied down. But the reality is that those stakes that hold us captive need not have any hold on us anymore. Because Luke 17, 6, Jesus said, if you have faith as a mustard seed, you can say to a mulberry tree, you can say to an 18-inch stake, be pulled up by the roots and be planted in the sea, and it would obey you. I'm telling you in the Holy Ghost, there's not one thing that your past informed you of that can keep you from the freedom and the power and the liberty of Jesus Christ. There is greater things in store for you. There is greater things in store for this church. Hallelujah. So I asked the question that I've asked before and I'm still asking today, what could God do in the next Five years. As we look at 29 and 30, in my life, well, God willing, I'd be 65 years old. In your life, you probably got too much pride to tell me, all right? But in this church's life, what I'm asking is to, to answer what could God do? if we realize that we have more power over an 18 inch stake than what has been said in our minds in the past. Well, to give you perspective for five years, maybe we ought to look back at the last five years. When you're talking about what could God do in the next five years, what has he done in the, in the past five years? Now, when you talk about five years, I get it, that's 19 to 20 in those aside from your Aldi grocery list, going from $50 to $77 from 19 to 24. <laughs> what did God do in the last five years since fall of 2019? Well, how would any of us predicted that we would have experienced a worldwide pandemic? The last message I preached in this sanctuary that you're sitting in before the shutdown in March was a divine shift. I talked about it. A divine shift is a supernatural move from one place, position, and direction to another. And just as in the natural, we can shift weight from one leg to another, right? 
There can be a change in our spiritual position or direction. A divine shift will cause a supernatural advancement and or change in your spiritual, emotional, and physical position. In short, divine is God and shift is movement, okay? And biblically, we can see that things happen in our physical world that are reflection in our spiritual world. Don't worry, I'm not going down that rabbit hole, whether COVID was God, man, devil, whatever. What I'm trying to tell you is that we went into a shift. And today you may say, Pastor, you're trying to build faith and you're trying to, to, to help us with our future. Why are you talking about a pandemic? <laughs> well, number one, because history can't be ignored. You are aware there was a pandemic five years ago, all right? We got a game in our closet. You know what the name of it? We've had it for years. You know what the name of it is? Pandemic. We ain't played that thing. We live that out. You say, why would you bring that up? Not only because it's reality, but because I want you to know that God is good and in control and brought us out of that. Did we see sorrow? Yes, we did. Was progress as we define it affected? Of course it was. But hear me, in all of that, I can remember where I was sitting in our house when a friend and a man of God called me in the midst of that and all the other cultural pressures and the injustices that was going on. And you know what he said? He said, there is an anointing of endurance. And just to hold on is a win. Hallelujah. And he said, we're standing here, one people united, when at that time, the temperature of the world was to divide. And if it's still there, I'm here to tell you that we are disciples of Jesus Christ, and we are still standing five years later. We didn't miss one lease payment, and in 2022, we celebrated 40 years of this ministry called Abundant Life Church. We're still standing. Next Sunday, it's All Nations Sunday. You know what? We're here together as celebrating because we're one people, there's one Lord, there's one faith, there's one baptism. Don't let the culture of this day divide us. We are united in the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's happened in the last five years? The best we can count, there's been 136 received the baptism of the Holy Spirit. To God be the glory. There's been almost 200 baptisms in water in the name of Jesus Christ. Minimally, we have record of, and I know there's more that happened than this, 64 uh, completed a personal Bible study. In these last five years, we began two preaching points, Baltimore City and the Spanish. And if God did all of that in the last five years today, what will he do in the next five years in your life, <laughs> in abundant life, and in the kingdom of God at large? Hey, what will God do in this very worship gathering if we pull up some stakes and we walk in freedom? By the way, the key to getting rid of that stake is just the name of Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. If we'll pull it up, we're going to see greater things. We have and we will endure. But I want to go beyond surviving to thriving. And I believe we are positioned like never before for God to do unprecedented things together in the name of Jesus. In Matthew 11, during Jesus' teaching on the role of John the Baptist's ministry in the kingdom, he was saying what role John played. This is what he says in Matthew eleven eleven. He said, among those born of women, there has not risen one greater than John the Baptist. But he who is the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. Now, I, don't breeze over what Jesus just said. 
He said, there's none like John the Baptist. In fact, the Amplified says, but it's the one that's the least in the kingdom of heaven that is greater in privilege than he. What's going on? John belonged to the age of the old covenant, which was preparatory to Christ. And the least of the New Testament believer sitting in this room has a higher privilege in Christ because you are a part of the bride of Christ. John the Baptist, he was a friend of the bridegroom. But here today, we understand after John, there was a shift a divine shift in eras. The new era is now so great that the lowliest member of it, the one that's the least in the kingdom of God, is greater than the greatest one in the previous era. Now, you got to keep reading your Bible. We know Jesus defined whoever is least. I don't know what you're saying. Like, by the way, who is the least around here? Do we need to compare bank accounts? Do we need to count friends? Oh, you're so way off. What Jesus said is whoever is the least is the, the one that takes the lowliest position as a child. Such a person, though least, is regarded by God as even greater than John the Baptist. Now, why is the least now greater than the greatest previously? You ready? This would be a good time to wake up. We are living in the culmination of the kingdom of God. Jesus said he had come to fulfill the law. In fact, when he walked this earth, he said the kingdom is here. And now in this post-resurrection era, we are in the last days. And Jesus said the least of these in the last day time period is greater than the greatest John the Baptist. I'm trying to preach to you that what if we truly embrace that kind of greater? I'm preaching because you don't see yourself like you read of John the Baptist that's walking around with a, with a camel's hair and, eating, and, and, and the fire and all of that stuff. Well, let me tell you, what if you and I truly caught a glimpse of what it means for greater things, that you have come to a place in God. It's the last days, and we are a part of a kingdom that has no end. What if you and I truly caught a glimpse of the vision that God is pouring out his spirit on all flesh as prophesied, that we are experiencing just a few minutes ago what angels desire to look into. I know we're human. I know we got our issues, but if I could get your attention, what you thought was so casual just 20 minutes ago, the angels are peering down saying, I wish that I could be a part of such a thing as this. What if we really believe that God has called us to the kingdom for such a time as this? What if we realized we don't have to see everything to have vision? I'm going to say that again. What if we realized, because I'm trying to help you like, Pastor, I'm trying to get with you, but I don't, I don't see it. Well, what if you don't have to see everything to have vision? Eric Weyenmayer, he knew the risk. For less than 1,200 at the time I'm referring had ever mounted the top of Mount Everest. And more than 175 died trying. But still Eric climbed, not seeing the drops or the fear on others' faces. And in fact, when he indeed reached the top, he did not even see the top. You say, well, maybe it was cloud cover. No, no, no. What you have to understand is that Eric Weyenmayer is blind. He climbed Mount Everest without his physical sight. And you know what it tells me? That it doesn't take sight to reach the top. It takes a vision. Eric said, I can't see 
like you can see, but I see something that maybe you don't see, and I can stand on the top of Mount Everest. I would to God there'd be some people here that would shake off those 18 inch stakes and say, I am ready to believe and walk into vision that I cannot even see. All right, you need Bible? 1 Corinthians 2, 9. But as it's written, eye has not seen, nor ear heard. It's not even entered the heart of man, the things that God has prepared for those who love him. But, but God has revealed them. What? What I can't see, what ear can't hear, what cannot enter the heart on our own. He has revealed those things to us. How? How? Yeah, it's on the board, class. How? Through his spirit. No wonder John said, I'm going to get in the spirit on the Lord's day. What would happen if we set aside our petty differences and our petty stakes and say, I just want to get in the spirit on the Lord's day because the spirit searches all things. Yea, the deep things of God. I'm here to tell you, when we get in the spirit, we're going to see things that we have not seen before. And I'm declaring greater things in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now you hear me, there is some truth in the wisdom of spirit-led strategies. There's wisdom in that. Spirit-led strategies, it builds momentum. And number two, it yields subsequent results. So for the next five years, for example, we can come up with spirit-led strategies. You'll hear some of those even in this message. But I want to share with this church what came to me as I was praying a couple weeks ago. Are you ready? I got another way of looking at this question, what will God do in the next five years? Beyond and addition to progression. Because I admit, I was thinking that way. Okay, we got five years. What are we going to do in those five years? And we're going to do all that, okay? But I got to rethinking that. And it seemed like the Lord just impressed upon me. Don't think progression. Think a defining moment. All right? Let me break that down. Okay, in other words, somewhere in the course of these next five years, five months, five days, five minutes, it's all a part of it. There could be just one phone call. There could be just one check. There could be just one decision. There could be just one Lydia that God brought us to. There could be just one ministry. There could just be one more called out, sold out disciple. What would happen if that happened? I'll tell you what, it's like the saying goes, the world has yet to see what God can do with one person wholly committed to Jesus Christ. In fact, as you sit here today, God can do more in this moment of five minutes than we can do in a lifetime. Somehow, I'm trying to ignite your faith. I'm trying to help you to pull up on that stake. God is doing greater things. Will it be a progression? Yes. But are you tracking me? Just one moment, and it can change everything in the course of God's kingdom. You say, I get it. What's my job? What's my job? Hungry. You got to be hungry. What's your job? You got to be full of faith and be faithful. What's your job? You've got to be all in. Something must shift in our attitude and our actions that embraces the mission more than ever before. We've said it a lot of different ways, but this is what I've changed to that's more succinct. You know what our mission of this church is? And you're gonna hear it in your community groups. Be a disciple, make a disciple. Can you say that with me please? Now I realize you gotta be converted in order to be a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ. 
So that begs the question, have you been born again of the water and spirit? Have you received the Holy Spirit when you believed? That's where it starts. But we must all, as spirit-led believers, do what Jesus said and deny ourselves and take up our cross and follow him. It looks like personal Bible studies and discipleship series. If you could see uh, our training center uh, yeah, uh, this morning, one, two, three, three or four rooms just filled with people that are growing. It's going to be our community groups. All of that is important, but it cannot end there. That's being a disciple. But notice, we've got to go on, and we've got to also make a disciple. We cannot say, I'm a fully devoted disciple of Jesus Christ without continuing the loop that he's called me to also make disciples. John 3, 3. What did Jesus say? He said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Everybody say, Jesus said that. How many believe you must be born again? Basically, what you just said is how many believe what Jesus just said. But you know the same Jesus that said, you got to be born again of the water and spirit? In Matthew 28, 19, that same Jesus, where's my shouters, said, go there, therefore and make disciples of all nations. Are you born again? Check. Are you making disciples? It's the same Jesus. This Thursday in our community groups, we're going to be talking about our mission is fishing. So you say, I'm not in a community group. Well, that can change very quickly. Just go on our website. Today and this Thursday, I want us to focus on people and names that we can fulfill the mission of being a disciple and making a disciple. Are you aware that making a disciple involves going? It, it, it doesn't focus on attracting. The center is deploying. Jesus said, go and make disciples. Did Jesus' ministry attract crowds? You're hearing the right answer. Yes. But what was his method of changing lives? It wasn't centered on attracting. It was centered on going, spending time with individuals. You can look in Matthew, and Jesus sent out 12 as lambs among the wolves. In Luke 10, he sent out the 70 as lambs among the wolves. And if we're going to reach our world, we cannot be afraid to go out where the wolves are because that's where the lost sheep are. Well, I like Sunday mornings. And after all, I did pass out a card and serve. Thank God for all that. But that doesn't mean you're making disciples. I'm preaching right now but I'm not making a disciple. Some of you are getting technical on that. Go with me. Our definition of success should be very closely associated with how well are we deploying. I'm going to ask you a question. You ask yourself, how am I going and making a difference in the lives outside of these four walls we call a church campus? Because when Jesus said, go make disciples, that's my part. And then when he said, I will build my church, that's his part. Obviously, I've been preparing and chewing on this for a good while. <clears throat> but just last night, I got permission to share, to share this. Felicia, man, where are you? I'll put my eyes on here. There you are. She just texted me, just excited. She was excited. So what's she texting you for? Well, trust me, I'll take her text. We call out for them, we're sick, we should. But she said, I just finished an Into His Marvelous Light Bible study with a young lady I met last week. She
She said, to make it short, she wants to be baptized in the name of Jesus next week, God willing. Then she said, she wants to do exploring God's word. That's an extended Bible study. She called her by name and she said how empty she described that she was feeling. And, and, and Felicia just said, well, you know, there's a God-sized void in all of us that only God can fill. And she said, I just told him he loves her with an everlasting love, and he loved her in her past mistakes, now in this moment, and through her growth. Now, what, where do you have to have a PhD in theology to do that? Oh, I just don't know what to say. There you go. I'll text you her script. Because you know what? She said, well, you know what? I've heard that before, but I didn't, it didn't feel real until I heard it this time. What am I trying to say? There are people out there all over, and I thank God for the euphoria of his manifested presence and how we experience God. But let me tell you, church, when you can, fit it, when you can finish that loop of not just being a disciple, but making a disciple, oh, we're going to pray on Tuesday. We're going to pray in our private closets. But spiritual warfare is not just prayer. You win wars just like natural warfare by taking new territory. And when you teach a Bible study, when you establish a small group, when you form a campus ministry, even doing a prayer walk in your neighborhood, we are in the midst of spiritual warfare. I'm going to say it again. Eye has not seen and ear has not heard. It's not even into the heart of man what God has prepared for those that love him. It's greater things. And by God's grace, we're going to be a part of it. So what is the mission? What is the mission? Sure. That's why I'm doing this. Show me that slide, sister. That's our mission. All right? That's our mission. That's what everything's about. You ready? Look over here. When DJ plays this, they turn me off. They don't turn him on. And they do turn him on. Oh, sorry guys, I gotta turn the volume on. You know what this is? It's our mission. Be a disciple, make a disciple. You say, well, I don't see that. Because every time somebody comes in here and they experience the presence of God through worship, it's all about getting them and you to be a disciple of the Lord Jesus Christ. So what's our mission? Now here's our process. Experience God, grow in faith, serve others, and go reach the world. This process right here helps us fulfill our mission. I've been preaching it. Ladies and gentlemen, you've got to experience God to become a disciple. And sure, that's why we have a physical building. That's why we've been renovating some things, to have everybody have a good experience when they come in. Okay, by the way, you can be a part of experience greeters by staying right where you are and just go to the left, to the right, in front, and behind, underneath, overhead, and smile and be friendly and say, do you mind filling out this card so we can send you a weekly update? <gasps> Me? Everybody point to yourself. Well, that's not my ministry. Wrong. You're a disciple of Jesus Christ. And everything we do is about people. I face that in youth ministry, but you're all so mature that I know you don't need this, but bear with me in my years of youth ministry. I'd have kids come up to me and say, who's that over there? I said, why don't you go find out? But you don't do that, you know what I'm saying? Experience, it's a part of the process. That's where we encounter God. But then you grow. 
To be a fully devoted disciple, you get equipped. You go from encounter to equipped. And that's what all of this is about. We're not about just having experience. We're about those experiences becoming relationships. But you don't just experience encounter. You don't just grow and equipped. You serve, which is act. It's action. Jesus loved the poor. He cared for the needy. Jesus was a man of action. You know what I love the scripture says? Jesus was moved with compassion. And that's when he fed the 5,000 the men plus women and children with loaves and fishes. You know what we say in compassion? Ooh. I'm so sorry. I'm so sorry. I love you. I'm so sorry. You know what Jesus said when he had compassion? He started serving them. It moved to action. I have no idea, and the Holy Spirit hasn't revealed to me what's going on in your brain right now. But I'm going to preach. Because experience is encounter. Grow is equip. Serve is act. And go is Jesus didn't stay right where he was. He went out. You say, well, I've been sitting here on this chair waiting for somebody, and pastor, if they'd come sit by me, I promise I'd be friendly. No, go. That's the moving part. That's the part. And we're in the process right now of doing our best to revamp this, to facilitate it, because what is, so, so, so here we go. The mission is? The mission is, go back slide. The process is? All right, go to my title slide. And this is the vision. We're going to see greater things. John 14, 12 says, Jesus said, he who believes in me, the works that I do, he will do also, and greater works than these he will do because I go to my Father. He said, I'm leaving in flesh, but I'm coming back in the Spirit. Verse 13, and then whatever you ask in my name, that will I do, that my Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. Keep reading that chapter. He starts talking about the Holy Ghost. I'm telling you, the Holy Ghost is the answer to this city. The Holy Ghost is the answer to your family. The Holy Ghost is the answer to your troubles. We shall see greater things. Somebody clap your hands and praise him right now. Look at your neighbor and say, you can be a part of greater. Say, you can be a part of greater. Something greater is already happening. Amen. I mean, I know there's physical things that we're doing. It's, I just want it to be a reflection of that new thing we started off here, our worship gathering. They mentioned it. We, we got a new connection center. They did a soft opening last week. Report is it worked. You just walk past these restrooms. Come see us, grab some coffee, snack, visit. If you're a guest today, do that. It's going to be awesome. But it's not for me or you if we're regulars unless we have a guest. So if people dying and going to hell didn't motivate you, if you want a cup of coffee, bring somebody to church. Amen. Greater things are happening. And I want you to pray on how you can grow and give in your time, talent, and treasure to see God and you go to that next level of greater things. Now, earlier in the year, I, I passed out a card. That's on the QR code. You can get your phone out right now, and you can scan it. There's also some in the giving kiosks. What's that all about? It's how you can personally incorporate corporately be a part of the greater vision. Now there's three things there. One is giving finances, all right? It's not a building fund. If God gives us money and a building, fine, we'll do it. But I think it's bigger than that. We need more than a building. We need an intentional effort to sow into the God-given harvest that we must reap.
And by the way, since May, I want to thank you for over $17,300 that's been given to the greater campaign. Thank you. Some are giving one time, some are giving monthly, but let me tell you, if you're not a part of that and this is your church, oh, I'm so thankful that you can pray in the spirit, but get your phone out and let's give because God is gonna do great things. When we open up the windows of heaven, he will pour out a blessing through our giving. I asked for permission on this, but in May, Ashton committed a monthly pledge for this next year to greater. Shortly thereafter, some of you don't know, he's an accountant. Some of you don't know, he's not like his father. I'm a kindergarten teacher, kind of, sort of. I can count to 10. But here's what one of the partners of the firm came to him, gave him an unexpected raise in addition to the typical year-end raise. They just said, it's for all the extra work you've done, staff members, turnover, you kept a positive attitude, here's a raise. You know what it was? It was double the amount that he gave to Grader. Some of you said, whoa, wait a minute. Let me scan that QR code. I want to scan that QR code. I think that's 50%. Is that 100%? What is that? I'm not going to count it. What's double? 100%? See, I told you I wouldn't count it. All right. Whoa, that's better than the bank. You know what? Sometimes Jesus does that. Has anybody in this room ever got a financial blessing when you gave? He gave back financially? Come on, look at me. That's great. How many say you, you've given and he didn't give it finances, but he gave you all kinds of other blessings that was better than money? Is this getting contagious that what would happen in the next five years if we decided we're going to get together? It's not just going to be funny money, but it's going to be growing. Let me pause because including my family, they lost it when I said funny instead of money. All right, here we go. Everybody say growing. growing. Did you know I can't remember in recent years the early response we've gotten from Purpose Institute like this semester. I tell you, you can ask the Taylors, you can ask Sister Shalon when it comes to community groups. I'm all in who's signing up, what's going on. You know why? Because everyone, it says they're growing, they're growing, they're getting involved. I'm a weirdo. I just love you so much that I want to see you grow. You know what's happening? It's not just giving, but it's growing. It's not just growing, but it's going. God's going to help us to see a 5% growth or more. Let me tell you, you can be involved in it. Just get a part of what God is doing. I got to tell you a couple more things and then we'll let the Lord do whatever he wants to do. Last fall, we had some consultants made some observations about our church. One of them was probably something we knew and that was and I pose it in a question. If this Abundant Life Church left this community of Rosedale, would it miss us? My answer, no, they wouldn't miss us. Not by and large. To some degree, but just being honest. Now some of that makes you comfortable, uncomfortable. Well, don't say that. Don't say the truth. I talked to a peer that leads a church greater numerically than I am. And uh, he said, they don't know that we're here. Just came from another church that they have a community director and that church knows plenty where they are. Here's what I'm saying. It's the 21237 area code that we've got to be prepared and practice supernatural works that affects people's life realities. I've been places before, say, would you like a Bible study? I say, well, can you give me a job? You say, well, jobs won't save them. Well, you know what? Jesus fed the five loaves and he used five loaves and two fish to feed them. So then he could teach them. Now, the mission, the mission is to be a disciple and make a disciple. 
The mission is not for me to be a soup kitchen. But if a soup kitchen will take them to the mission, I'm all for it. So there's some things we've got going, but I'm telling you right now, you can just sit here and be bored with this, and that's fine. It's not fine, but that's on you. But there's people going to get a hold of this. There's an Eastern Regional Resource Center. And some of you are aware of this. You can see pictures that you've seen in the past. But we serve food there monthly. We're believing this is going to turn into Bible studies and life enrichments, whatever it is. There's a QR code in the weekly update. There's one out in the foyer in our television monitor. You know what's happening is people are going there once a month. My wife and I looked at schedule. We literally cannot go any time between now and the end of the year. But you know what? You go in there and you serve people that do not have a home and they're sheltered there. And, and, and love is poured out. Jesus said that when you give a dinner or supper, don't ask your friends or your brothers or your relatives or your rich neighbors lest they invite you back and be repaid. But when you give a feast, invite the poor and the maimed and the lame and the blind and you will be blessed because they cannot repay you but you're going to be repaid at the resurrection of the just. What about it? 21237 I'm so excited about the Red Run House Elementary. Some of you are here for a promotion Sunday. Julie came. She did an on-site visit. We gave school supplies. Now they're asking for toiletries and hygiene needs. You know why? Because the school they serve, many of the families do not have what they need. Are you hearing me today? I'm so excited because God's going to give us the grace that, oh, I always get mixed up with this. Uh, Red Run House is going to say, I know who abundant life is. <laughs> Eastern Regional is going to say, I know who abundant life is. Not for our promotional, but abundant life represents the mission that we have been called to make disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's not just my job, that's your job, your job, your job, your job. Calling, let's get a part of what God is doing. I got one more to tell you about. Brand new. It's a thing called Navigate. Brother Sean Taylor, would you and your team stand real quick, please? They were here a couple weeks ago training. All right. Well, Sean, you were the slowest one and you're the youngest of us. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so thank you. I thank this team. You said, what's it all about? Go on the website, abundantlifebaltimore.com slash navigate. Preferably on your time, not mine. Um, but it just simply talks about life is full of obstacles. How many have experienced loss and emotional pain and failure, betrayal, trauma? That's all been a part of our lives, right? And then we get all sideways. And our responses aren't always so good. They can be fear and anxiety and addiction and guilt and rage and all these things. And so... Every Tuesday night, starting in November, they're going to meet October. Amen. I do the vision, they do the details. Amen. They're going to start meeting. And here's where I need your help. I think we're going to get some cards coming out that you can pass out. You are going to be our evangelist. That if you know people that need help in moving towards purpose and peace and fulfillment. There's a place. We're gonna try our best to serve our community. Now, you know what? This, this, is for, this is for making disciples outside of our building that we want to, them to have a path for healing. It's gonna take work, but I'm telling you, it's worth it. People are worth it. If anything helps me to, that's it. <clears throat> if anything helps me to focus when I get weary, I'm preaching out right now. You think I always want to do this? No. But if anything motivates me is, what if someone hadn't told me about Jesus? What if somebody hadn't taken the time to do something to pass out that gospel net? Why don't we lift our hands right now in the name of Jesus and ask him to talk to us right now. Greater things are in store. 
But we've got to say, Lord, here I am. I'm willing. I'm fully aware. There's no way one person can do all of this. But wouldn't you agree that there are so many opportunities to get a part of this vision? I'm asking you to start with a greater response card in giving and growing and going. If you'll scan that QR code that's on the screen, if you'll do it at the kiosk, that you'll mark this, that we're going to give of our finances, we're going to give of our time and our resources. This Saturday, All Nations Outreach at noon. You can walk these streets, get your steps in, and never talk to anybody. We're just trying to get cards out into the doorway. We can do that for an hour or an hour and a half or make some phone calls. That's what can happen. I'm asking you right now and Thursday to start praying for what is my list of people that I can start connecting to and making friends with to make disciples. Oh, could somebody help us with Eastern Regional and serve, invite people to navigate to our hurting people in our neighborhoods. That's what God's called us to, and we can and we shall make a difference. If God tarries, I wish you a wonderful retirement. I wouldn't mind one of those myself. But I will and you will never retire from the mission. There was a magician who fell in disfavor with the king and was sentenced to death on the day of his scheduled execution. The magician told the king, wait a minute, sir. If you will allow me to live one more year, I'll make you as the king world famous. Well, that ego perked up. What are you talking about? He said, the magician, I guarantee you, I can make your horse talk, king. And when I make your horse talk, you as a king are going to be worldwide famous. And if I fail, sir, you'll kill me. And I have no objection. The king, he agreed to it. He said, I'll give you one more year. And he placed him back in the dungeon. There was a duke who was a friend of this magician, snuck into the dungeon and said, you indeed are a fool. You know, and I know, that you don't have the power to make the king's horse talk. You have no hope of success whatsoever. You are surely going to die. To which the magician replied, but I've got one more year to live. Many things can happen in one year. Maybe the king will die. I might die. Or maybe I can teach a horse to talk. Regardless, I still have one more year. A lot can happen in a year. So what are you going to do with the coming year that God has given you? A lot can happen in five years. What are you going to do, abundant life, with the next five years that God has given you? You know what it sounds like to me? This magician is like Esther. If I perish, I perish. I'm going to see the king. Sounds like to me those four lepers that say, if I stay in this famine, I'm going to die. If I go to the enemy's camp, I could die. But what do I have to lose? And when they moved, God had already moved. 
what would happen if you would just move, if you'd say, I've got the power to get that stake up out of the ground. I'll tell you what's gonna happen. God's already moving in this community, in your family, in your life. Let's stand right now, please. So what trajectory will you commit to? What faith will you ignite to pull that stake out of the ground? What moment will you believe for that will change history for you and the church and the kingdom? It all comes down to a mission to be a disciple and make a disciple. A process that every one of us and those we lead must experience God, grow in our faith, serve others, go reach the world. And it all comes down to a vision that we don't have to see, but we can believe. And that's called greater things. If you're a guest with us today, I'm so glad you're here because God can and will do greater things for you today. If this is your church home, you're an attendee, why don't you go from an attendee to a member? Why don't you go from a member to a called out, sold out, whatever it is, let's take that next step because the greatest step in a person's life is their next step. So today, whether you're a guest, attendee, or member, if you're ready to say, Jesus, I don't know what it looks like. Pastor's given me a lot of action points, but I'm ready to do what I can do to be involved in greater things. I'm asking you to leave that chair where you are and get as close to the front and stand. If you physically can't do that, I get it. If you want to come and sit on the front row, you can do it. If there's 10 people, if there's 110, I am here to say, who wants to cross the line and say, God, whatever it is, I'll trust you with my finances, my treasure. I'll trust you with my time. I'll trust you with, with my talents. In fact, they're not even mine. They're what you gave me, and I give it back to you. If there's 10, if there's 110, if there's 70, whatever it is, I'm asking you right now. I understand if you physically can't come. If you can come to the front and sit on the front row, that's great. If you can't do that, just say, Jesus, I'm waving my hands. I'm doing something to let this world know that I want to be a part of greater things. That's it. When you come, I want you to start talking to Jesus and say, Jesus, lay on my heart what you want me to do in the name of the Lord. In the name of Jesus, that's it, just pray right now. That's it, in the name of Jesus. I know the Spirit's talking to you and you're talking to the Spirit. It doesn't have to do with decibels. That's it right now, Lord Jesus. Speak to me, Jesus. Speak to me a ministry. Speak to me a dollar figure. Speak to me my next step in growth. I just got to be serious about this. Your coming is soon. The harvest is white, ready for harvest. I can't afford to get sideways. You're realigning my purpose. That's it right now. In the name of Jesus, talk to Jesus. Let Jesus talk to you right now. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. That's it. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. That's it. Keep praying. 